This morning we spent some time looking at Abraham's experience with God and God's experience with Abraham. And when all was said and done and Abraham was called upon to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, he did not withhold his son. And when God saw that and knew that, then he responded by making sure that a sacrifice was available to take Isaac's place. In that experience, Abraham designated the place where that experience took place, and he called it Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah will provide. And we spent some time looking at the spiritual application of that, that we ought to always know as we see the promise kept to Abraham that brings it all the way through to us being heirs according to the promise. And that promise being that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. And not just blessed in a, a prosperous way of living on this earth, but blessed in a way of a sacrifice being offered for them and redemption being theirs. Tonight we want to look further at that particular emphasis and put it in a New Testament context of Philippians chapter 4. Oftentimes we go to that chapter and we really enjoy, at least I do, looking at chapter 4 and verse 13 that underscores what should be our approach and our philosophy to life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that should be our attitude and disposition. But in the context of what we're talking about today, Jehovah Jireh, that God will provide, this context echoes that. There are more verses to that particular section than just verse 13. Look with me, if you will, at beginning at verse 14. It said, Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my afflictions. Paul acknowledges that these Philippian Christians did something well. They helped and assisted him in his ministry. He said, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. But even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessities, not because I desired a gift, but I desired fruit. You may abound in your account. But I have all and abound. I am full and have received of Aphrodite the things which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to the Lord. You remember we spent a few weeks ago time looking at the spiritual fragrance that is pleasing to God. And this was one of the verses that we looked at, that here's an attitude and disposition and an action of Christians that not only assisted and helped Paul, but was a sweet-smelling savor to God. Now look at verse 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Sounds real familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like what Jehovah Jireh means. God will provide. Now he gave these Christians credit by saying, you've sent once and again to my needs. But he understands that that would not have taken place had they not been in Christ. Had they not had the same goal and the same purpose in mind. When we describe our experience in our family sometimes, particularly when we, we get older in life or we might say more mature in life, we look back at our parents and say, they were a good provider. We might say of our father who worked multiple jobs, you know, well, he was a, a really good provider. Our mother who was always dedicated and went the second and third mile to, to make sure we had what we needed, she was a good provider. Now, while we were growing up, we might not have thought that. We might not have gotten our way or we may not have gotten exactly what we wanted when we wanted it. But when we got older and looked at all it takes to provide for the needs of the family, we had a different perspective and said they were good providers. They may not have had the 
the extensive education. They may not have had advanced jobs, but they work really hard to provide for their families. Well, in this context, a lot of work is going on with Christians. And it relates back to their relationship with God. Because He was a good provider. And you see, because God provides so well, He has expectations of us. When you look at how the Lord provides for us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, when He's teaching disciples how to pray and what to pray for, He says that God already knows, the Father already knows what we need before we ask. And so when we're talking about our needs and those being provided, Paul said, you provided once and again for my needs. But here's what you need to also know is that, that God shall supply all of your needs. A good provider knows what the family needs. And we're a spiritual family, and the Lord already knows what we need before we ever ask. You see, parents are that way, aren't they? They know what we need before we ask. We may ask for things, but they already know what we need. Now, when we ask, we might not always ask what for what we need. We may ask for what we want. But there are occasions when we ask for things that we need. We may not be sure at the time when those things are going to be provided, but our parents would already know that we need them. So our spiritual father already knows what we need. He knows that those things will and can be provided for us on his timetable. When you look at broader context and reference to that, he also knows why we need it. And we might even say, when we need it. There's an occasion in Paul's life, the one who wrote this letter to the Philippians, when he writes to the Corinthian Christians in, in 1 Corinthians, or rather 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's interesting when you look specifically at his relationship with that thorn in the flesh, he ends up praying three different times for the Lord to remove it. In his mind and in his experience, it was an imposition that hindered him from doing what he felt like he should do and wanted to do. And when you look at that context beginning at verse 8, he says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that he might, it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in the infirmities and in reproach and necessities and persecution and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And he tells us in that context that the Lord told him the reason for that is so that he would not be prideful in himself. Now that wasn't Paul's reasoning in that. And you and I know Paul well enough that he's, he didn't say, well, if you take this thorn in the flesh away, I'll just be able to enjoy life in general. Paul just wanted to serve God. But whatever the thorn in the flesh was, and we ask lots of questions about that, don't we? We have lots of speculation about what that just has to be. And sometimes it's because of what our thorn in the flesh is. Like, it has to be this. Because here's something that I would love to be removed from me, and, and that must be what Paul is undergoing. But whatever it was, this God who knows what we need also knows why we need it. He felt like whatever that thorn in the flesh was, Paul needed a reminder of his dependence on God. Paul needed a reminder that this life wasn't the end of things. Paul needed a reminder that there would be a time and a place when all the pains and all the distractions and all the thorns of life would be removed. Sometimes, if we don't appreciate having a good provider, someone who knows what we need and why we need it, then we might be those who would say, well, look, I'm just, uh, I am just not going to serve you and I'm not going to respect you and I'm not going to do this if you don't provide what I ask. When I ask it. And Paul didn't just ask for it. He said, take it away. Remove it. And he didn't just ask once. He asked three different times. 
take this away from me. And God refused to do it. The request was made. God knew he had a thorn in the flesh before he ever asked. And that's what Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 says. He knows before we ask. But in that particular case, under those particular circumstances, he said to Paul, not taking it away. Because as a good provider, he knew what Paul needed. And you heard Paul say, look, in my weakness, I'm made strong. In those things I can't control that, that God has refused to take away from me, it lets me know what my relationship to God really is. And I can bear up under that. I will bear those afflictions because I know what my Lord has borne for me. When we recognize who the provider is and how well He provides for us, it ought to inspire us to do His will. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 32, describes for us this endurance of life that we're to be in. And it puts it in the context again of what's been provided for us that we have to understand that we devote ourselves to enduring through this life so that we can have the blessings of the life to come. But then when you get in the third place, you see in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, He not only knows before we ask what we need, and He not only knows why we need it, but the Lord knows as a good provider... He knows what we ought to do with what He's provided. You know, when our parents provide for us for things, they expect us to use it. If they buy us clothing, and they expect us to take care of them. If they provide us things for school, they expect us to use those constructively in our studies and our preparation and our homework. Their expectation to say, this is what I'm providing for you, and this is why. This is how I intend to use it. You know, nowadays we get all kinds of things that are just gifts and, and no expectations. But there are some of us can remember even when we got things like bicycles, they were for a reason. You had a paper route or something, you had to do that bicycle, or you had to go to the store and run the errands. It wasn't just a gift. It was to aid you in doing the chores that would help and assist in the family. It might be fun to you to ride on it, but there was a responsibility for you to take care of it and to run those errands that needed to be run. Not everybody had vehicles so they could just run to town four or five times a day, and, and so chores had to be done. So there was some expectation to say, I know you need that, but here's what I expect you to do with that. When you look at passages like Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, that same apostle who spoke to those Philippian Christians and said that, God will provide for you, that God will sustain you, that God will provide all your needs. He said to the Ephesian Christians, those of you who have stolen, steal no more. Rather, work with your hands. Now, you can't read into that and say, work with your hands so you'll have everything you need. He said, work with your hands that you may have to give to them who have need. If the Lord gives you strength, and the Lord forgives you from stealing, and you have an opportunity to, to work and take care of yourself, you work with the intent to help take care of others also. You work with your hands with the intended purpose so that you can have to give to those who need. Now this God who is a good provider... And who provides for all of our needs expect us to be participants in providing for the needs of others. Now that passage in Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, You sent once and again to my needs. Now he closes his thoughts by saying, God's going to take care of your needs. But he acknowledged, here's what you're doing with what God blessed you with. You've sent to me on many occasions to assist and to help me in my afflictions. He's grateful for it. He's inspiring them to continue in it. He's kind of in essence saying, you have these blessings, now you use them to God's glory. And God will continue to be a good provider for you. He will continue to give you those things that you need because He knows you'll use them for what He intended for. 
You ever provided something for someone, they needed it, and you provided it for them and they didn't use it for what it was intended for? Disappointing, isn't it? You think, well, you know, I, I took from my own funds. You might even on occasion say, you know, I, I took things that I had saved up for myself, but this person really needed that, and so I provided it for them, and they didn't utilize it in a way that would have been helpful to them and would have filled the need that they obviously had. So God provides for us, and Paul said, you can count on that. Your God is a good provider. He will provide all your needs, but you also need to be conscious that as He provides for you, He has expectations of you. That you would work and provide for others. And then you look at passages like Titus chapter 2. Um, and you look specifically at, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's Titus chapter 3. And if I've got my chapters right. <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 12. He talks about, he shall send Artemis unto, unto thee, or Tychius. He said, Be diligent to come unto me in Nicopolis, for I am determined there to win her. You notice the interchange there of the manning of the forces? He said, I'm sending someone to you, and I have expectations that you send someone back to me. I know that there are needs that you have, and I'm sending folks to take care of that need. And here are the interactions of Christians who God will provide for. God's a good provider, and so he created this network of people that he provides for. And Paul says, I'm sending folks to you, and, and they're going to be an encouragement to you. They're going to help you, but I plan to win her here, so I want you to send someone and something back to me. That's really the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? He knows not only what we need before we ask it. He knows why we need it. And he has an expectation of how we're supposed to use when he provides those needs. Paul continues in that context and said, Bring Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey, would, uh, journey diligently that nothing be wanting unto them. You send them unto me and you make sure you provide what they need on their journey to me. There's a process to that, isn't it? There's a function going on among God's people. All the forces are being manned here. Ministry is being taken care of. The gospel is being preached. And everybody involved here has been blessed by God to be a child of God. And now there's some expectations. We're in this thing together. And I'm going to make sure you have what you need. And we're going to be conscious that all of our needs are met by God because He's a good provider. You know, when all is said and done, if our parents were good providers we'd be total ingrates wouldn't we if we were parents and not good providers that we had responsibilities and we didn't carry them out we had those who were dependent upon us and we neglected them when we had the example and we were conscious that people provided for us when we could not provide for ourselves so it is in Christ when we recognize spiritually we're in need. We're in need of a spiritual physician to heal us and to make us whole. For a sacrifice to take our sins away. For a Savior to come and redeem us and take us to heaven. We're in great need spiritually. And if those needs have been met by the good provider, the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah provides if He provides, then those of us who have His provisions are to be as Paul describes here. Notice verse 14 of Titus chapter 3. He said, And let ours, I like that terminology, don't you? Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Let ours. You know, it's kind of us, isn't it? We make up this congregation, we're the hours of the local sphere here in Crossit. And Paul is having this conversation with this collected group of Christians. And he said, 
those that are ours, those among us, those that we're talking about, those that have experienced this beneficiary relationship with God, those who understand the responsibility, you make sure that those who are ours learn to maintain good works. How do you get the reputation of being a good provider? You just don't bring home one paycheck and provide one meal. You get the reputation of being a good provider if you constantly provide the meals and care, don't you? And that's when your life is summed up and the experience of growing up in that environment say, here's what I remember. They were good providers. Because that environment was maintained. The good works were constant. And so we acknowledge their past influence on our life and say they were good providers Paul said here's what's going on with us we've got to stay active in these things I'm going to send what you need I know there are things that you need to accomplish and here people help you accomplish those here's what I'm going to stay here for the winter you send those things back to me and while you're at it you remind them who we are those who are ours those that we have influence over those that we are identified with those of us who know God as the provider, let's be busy at good works. He said, for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. You see, to have that training and that upbringing and be taught those skills and have that example and not use it would be unfruitful. But when you maintain it, you replicate it then that good work continues. And that God who is a good provider, that Jehovah Jireh, says through His Son in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. Cities set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all in the house. Jehovah Jireh, who provides all good things, has expectations of those who are ours, those who are His. He said, let your light so shine that they may see your good works, and glorify the Father who art in heaven. You see, when we're doing those things for others that God has done for us, God gets the credit for it. How many times have you said in your life, when somebody compliments you about your work ethics or you providing for your family or your love for your family, how many times have you related back, here's what I was taught? And you connect it back to the one who taught you. That's what these passages are about. That Jehovah Jireh who always provides, provides an opportunity for us to emulate Him. And those good works that He's taught us, that He's shared with us, we're to maintain so that we're not unfruitful. Those are important things for all of us to remember. When you think about those matters and you realize how important it is for us to to do those good works may we refocus our minds and say you know this Jehovah Jireh who will provide knows what I need before I ever ask now in that passage in Matthew chapter 6 he's encouraging us to ask but he's encouraging us to ask of someone who already knows what we need. And so if we're asking for what we need, we have someone who provides for our needs. And we have Jehovah Jireh who knows why we need it. And so that means that he may not give us what we ask for because he knows what we need and he knows why we need that. But He will explain that to us in our lives by blessing us in the efforts we put forth in His kingdom. 
But that Jehovah Jireh also knows we ought to use the blessings He's bestowed upon us and the needs that He's filled. The Philippians 4 passage contains all those components. Paul says, you know, and I want to remind you of what you know, God will provide for all of your needs. But I also want you to know that you've represented God in sending and taking care of my needs on many occasions. And I'm grateful. And I'm appreciative. And I want you to know that what you've done and what you continue to do goes up before God as a sweet smell in His presence. Parents, look at their children who take those lessons they've learned and those provisions they've made and they use them wisely and they duplicate that work ethics and they're kind to others and they provide and protect their families. They look at that the same way God looks at us maintaining those good works with the blessings He bestowed upon us. We know, according to James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of life, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That variableness, there's no change or altering in God's disposition, His personality, or His provisions. Every good thing that's possible for us to have comes from Him. And that never changes. In other words, He is a good provider who has always been is currently and will always be a good provider of all that we need. The greatest need that you and I have is for our sin to be removed. And Jehovah Jireh sent His Son to take away our sins. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we recognize that and we acknowledge that He's done that for us, that He is the very Son of God. He is the answer. He is God's provision. And we're willing to then turn away from our sins that caused Him to have to die in the first place. And we're willing with our own lips to acknowledge all of His spiritual provisions that are made possible in Christ, and we submit to Him in baptism. Then we have put ourselves in a position to be able to address Him as our Father and know that He knows exactly what we need, why and when we need it, and that He has expectations of us as we rise to walk in newness of life to be known for good works and He'll be glorified for it. Those of us who are children of God, these letters are written to Christians to remind them of who they are. And Paul said, you remember when he spoke to Titus, and let ours learn. Ours, those who are already in this blessed relationship with God, remind them of who we are. That they maintain those good works so that they're not unfruitful. When we become unfruitful, we can confess our unfruitfulness. And Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides will provide forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's our greatest need, isn't it? That constant and continual cleansing. If we can assist that be true of you tonight, you let that be known while we stand and while we sing.